Hi, everybody, and welcome to episode 24 of the Talk is Cheap show. I hope all you guys are out there uh, health, healthy and safe and following the government guidelines, uh, not to come out unless you have to and all the rest of it. My man, Curtis, man, in the house. What are you saying? Oh, good, bro, man. We're on lockdown still, just surviving, you know, it is. Yeah, what have you been up to, man? Apart from just staying indoors, what are you, how have you been occupying yourself? Well, I just, I've been trying to exercise. I've been um, going on runs, going on a bike, um, trying to do a little home workout, just playing FIFA, you know, anything, man, anything to get through. A bit of studying as well, just anything to pass the time, man. Yeah, likewise, I've been doing similar things, man. Um, just staying active as much as I possibly can. I've been doing, trying to get out on the road, been doing a bit of road running and then um, yeah. I've been enjoying it. Uh, mm. But I had a little problem with my knee, swole up a little bit, probably had a bit of water on there, but um, that mm. subsided. So I've been back doing that. I've been doing some stuff at home and just trying to keep busy. So um, it, looks like we're going to have at least another three weeks of it. So we have to get used to it, I guess, man. So, you know what I mean? Yeah, for real, for real. Um, Right, people, so for uh, those of you who watched last week, you will know that we're uh, experimenting with a slightly different format. The show's taken on a slightly different format since the lockdown. And um, basically what we're doing is, is that uh, I've compiled a list of subjects to talk about. Uh, we're going to get our resident expert, Curtis, here to um, give us his views on that, chop it up a little bit and um, see where we go, man. Yeah, so man. Are you, you, you ready to go, Curtis? Ready to go, man. Let's go. Nice one, nice one. But before we start, um, I just would like to say that um, before we come on air, about half an hour before we come on air, I've got some really sad news, actually, that uh, a good friend of mine, Mick Justin, who I used to go to college with back in the day, I just found out that he passed away. So um, before I go any further, I just want to send the family condolences. Um, and it's ironic that it's on a football show. Because uh, Mick Justin, he has a son called James, James Justin, who played for Luton and he's now playing for Leicester. Um, mm. So, yeah, condolences. They're a great family. I mean, I've never met James Justin, but I know the fam I know Mick and his brothers very well and his sister very well. So I just want to put that out there. Condolences to Mick at this very sad time. Right. OK, so without any further ado, there's been a lot been going on, even though. You know, even though there's been no football, football yeah. is, uh, as what we said before, is the gift that keeps giving. And there's been a lot going mm. on. Um, the Premier League bosses met last week and um, high up on the agenda was season restart. So what was agreed at that meeting, we've been told, is that they're, they're muting or a tentative meeting of a restart on the 8th of June. So, Curtis, I wanted to know what you felt about that. Is that feasible? Um, I, I mean, where we are... I do have a supplementary to that question. It's going to lead me nicely on to another question I was going to ask. But, yeah. So, do yeah. you think, and I know we speak about this quite a lot, so you don't have to go yeah. on for too long. Do you think that, the, given what we're going through now, that that June the 8th is feasible? They're talking about June the 8th, playing the games behind closed doors. What do you think, my man? I mean I mean, where we are at the moment, bro, like, I don't see how it can go from being on complete lockdown to, I mean, what, June the 8th is probably six weeks. Yeah. They're saying in six weeks they can be back on a football pitch playing Premier League games. I don't see that happening, I'll be honest with you. Um, we're in a three week, yeah, um, three more weeks at the moment. I can't see it being finished after three weeks, so... It seems a long way off at the moment, but, you know, the money talks, man. I'm sure um, they'll try and find a way of doing it. I mean, there's some clubs like Bayern Munich and that, they're training. So maybe, but at the moment, it doesn't really look feasible to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I must admit, it. it <laughs> I mean, I know we talk about this a lot and the situations will change. The dynamics will change depending on the the advice we get from the government and the scientists, et cetera. But um, all I can say about that is, is uh, um, I'm optimistic that we'll get some football again soon. You know what I mean? That's all I can really say about that. But that kind of segue nicely into uh, the next thing I was going to ask you about, which is that the reports have come out just today, actually, that um, if there is no football, so for example, should the season be null and voided, say they said 
today or tomorrow, whatever. No more football for the season. Um, do you know, you probably do know actually, that that would mean that Arsenal could actually <laughs> qualify for the Champions League by virtue <laughs> of the uh, UEFA's coefficient system. Uh, yeah. Where that is that they look at your record in Europe going back X amount of years and they allocate points. Uh, and they reckon that if they did that, Arsenal would qualify for the Champions League ahead of teams like Chelsea and so forth. So although we're mm. ninth in the table at the moment, <laughs> <laughs> we could actually qualify for Champions League football. What's your yeah. thoughts on that, my man? Well, Big Wenger's done it again, man. 20 years in the Champions <laughs> League, you know. <laughs> All them coefficient points he's left behind, man. But, yeah, because, I mean, obviously, if Manchester City are banned as well, um, which I think they will be banned next season, to be honest. Um, yeah, so, I think, they were saying, I think they were saying Liverpool, Arsenal, Manchester United and Chelsea would be the four teams that have got the most coefficient points. Um so, yeah, maybe we'd get in the Champions League. I mean, we, we certainly don't deserve to be in the Champions League the way we've played this season. Um, but we'll take it by any means, man. That might make a Bamiyang stay. You know, it might make us get some big signings next year. I'll take it. I don't care how we get in there, man. But it'll I, think, be interesting. I think most fans would, to be honest. But, um, yeah. I mean, obviously, it's a little unfair. It would be a bit unfair on the other clubs, but presumably mm. you're, not, you're not particularly bothered about that. No, no, I'm not too bothered yeah. about them. We've got to worry about ourselves, man, I'm telling you. Yeah. So, given that then, um, OK, we just spoke about the possibility um, of the season starting back on June the 8th. So then, given what you're now saying, that probably means that you're not too fussed about if the season does restart or not for now. I mean, um, well, if that was the scenario, that if it's null and void and we get in the Champions League, let's, let's get this season finished. Wipe it off. Get rid of it. <laughs> but, <laughs> look, I think I think the Premier League will do everything they can to finish it because there's a lot of money on the table, man, and ultimately that's what they rely on and care about the most. Um, mm. It's just how long this goes on for. I think if it goes deep into the summer and June, going towards July, I don't see how you can finish this season because it's going to run too far into next season. So, yeah, yeah. I think it'll be interesting. But like you said, it can change from day to day, can't it? Yeah, it can change from day to day. And I think you're right. I think the, the Premier League bosses, I think that they will do their absolute best to ensure that the season does get completed. Um, number one, for the financial aspects. And number two, it's related to finance, but um, the litigation that might follow, you know what I mean? I mean, yeah, for real. I'm reading, uh, you know, there's clubs getting ready to slap their... <laughs> The writs on the table, man, if the season doesn't get yeah. completed. So, but yeah, that was an interesting aside to that one. But moving yeah. on, then, um, yeah. I guess it's a story that's been, um, I guess you know what I'm coming <laughs> with now. It's a story that's been, um, <laughs> and it involves <laughs> the O word, man. I mean, we said last oh, week right. the, show, the O word was banned from <laughs> the show. Um, yeah. Lo and behold, man, that O word is back out there again. Uh, and it's. it's <laughs> Yeah, it is. Mesut Ozil, man, and his pay cuts thing. First first up, just before we get to Ozil, I know we spoke about the pay cuts previously. Yeah. But when we spoke previously, that was just a generic uh, pay cut issue um, across the the whole of the Premier League, the foot, you know, all the players and so forth. But this week, we, we learned that Arsenal had approached their players and asked them to take a 12.5% pay cut. Um, mm. and if they qualify for the Champions League they would get that money refunded later I think a similar situation applied to the Europa League that was 7% but anyway 10%. so they had, the, they had this meeting and they put it to the players and then it transpired that Ozil was one of three players who um, sorry we're getting some interference here apologies for that um, Ozil was one of three players that um I turned this down. So, my man, what are you saying about that, bro? I mean, first of all, I think the club have embarrassed themselves, um, if I'm honest. Not necessarily right. in asking players to take the pay cuts, but the fact that this story's been leaked into the press, I think that does them no favours whatsoever. It, it makes us look like a small club um, amongst the press and the fans. 
in terms of the pay cut itself, initially when I read the story, I, I was quite split on it because my initial reaction was, you know, I can't believe Ozil hasn't taken a pay cut when he's the highest paid player in the history of the club. But then on the flip side, you know, we're one of the richest clubs, one of the biggest clubs in the world. You know, should they be taking a pay cut in the first place? You know, Stan Kroenke doesn't invest money out of his own pocket. And, you know, he says that over and over again. He doesn't spend big money in, in the transfer market. And, um, you know, I kind of think Ozil, it's a tough one because I think Ozil's looking at it going... Number one, you don't invest in the club. Number two, they try to force him out of the club. And, of course, his agent is in his ear saying, you know, none of my clients are taking pay cuts. So I don't want to jump on Ozil too much because if you read the whole story, apparently he is still speaking to the club. He hasn't completely said no. Um, but, you know, I kind of look at it like, you know, I was reading the story about Messi how he took a 70% pay cut along with all the other players at Barcelona. I think the highest earner effectively is the leader. So if you see Messi take that pay cut, the other players are going to think, well, you know, he's doing it. Why should I? If Ozil's not doing it, it sends a real bad message throughout the rest of the club. And I think even though Kroenke is a rich man, anyone in business right now is taking a hit. Their pockets are taking a hit. So they're going to try and make cuts. And I think, you know, Ozil's got his own reasons, but it doesn't look good that it was it was put in the press. Um, I'm a little yeah, bit I mean, split. I'm, yeah, I'm with you on that. I mean, there's a couple of things that I took from that. I mean, the first up is that the PR didn't do Ozil any favours mm -hmm. at all, did it? Um, no. And I know previously, he, um, and this is something that me and you have spoken about before, is that his agent, I think his name's called Ergen Sotu or something like that. He has mm -hmm. said that um, he would be advising all the players that he represents, of which Ozil is the most high-profile player, not to yeah. take pay cuts, but to ask for deferrals. So that was already out there. Um, mm. But yeah, and, and listen, we've spoken again about this uh, as a subject before. Players apparently being forced or leaned on to take pay cuts is not something that I necessarily do because at the end of the day they are contracted um, mm. so asking someone to take a pay cut can be sometimes be seen as a bit of pressure and I don't think that they should automatically agree to it no. or just because everyone else is going along with it you know um, but yeah you're right man I mean it's a real PR foo par on his part isn't it because mm. when you're the highest paid player and um, it has to be said even though it shouldn't automatically go side by side that He's not exactly performed up to expectation. People are going yeah. to look at you. Like you said, you're going to, uh, people are going to look towards you to set the tone for the rest of the club. Um, mm. And so the likes of Piers Morgan now, that just gave him ammunition <laughs> to just go in on him. Because they're saying, yeah. listen, man, you know what I mean? You're the, high, you're the club's highest paid player. Uh, the whole world right now is going through tough times. And... Um, you're refusing to budge. It doesn't make you look good. But then on the other side, and I know this has been debated constantly on the channel. Uh, I saw a really good show the other day, actually, with Robbie, uh, and he'd interviewed DT. He was making a passionate defense for Ozil. Uh, and then a few hours later, he had Lee Gunner on, who was making a, <laughs> a, a robust <laughs> attack on, um, yeah. he was saying that he, he should follow suit. But, um, yeah, man, it's a tricky one, man. Um, and, but what do you think of the... I mean, listen, this news was obviously leaked to the press. Yeah. What's your views on that, man? I mean, that was, I that think was, it, that was untoward, right? Sure. That was untoward. For me, I think that's come from the club. I don't, I don't necessarily think that's well, come from the club. Could it be a player? Could it be a player? It could be. A it could player? be. Yeah, if I was betting on it, I would say it's not a player. I would think it was somebody... I think they probably took offence to the fact Ozil said no and thought, you know what, we need to put some pressure on this guy. And, and they've probably leaked it, you know, because John Cross seemed all over it. And the fact that, you know, why do we not know who the other two players are? It just seems well, to be yeah, Ozil. I was going to go on to ask you that. Yeah, I was going to go on to ask you that. <laughs> who do you think yeah. the other two players might be? 
I mean, it's it's a tough one, isn't it? I, I don't even really want to speculate because yeah, I think yeah, maybe it's unfair to speculate. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a, it's an interesting one, but the Ozil one, it's difficult. I mean, I mean, I mean, listen, listen. You see, with Ozil, right? As well, I think we have to also take into account that um, as far as footballers go, Mesut Ozil is a renowned philanthropist, isn't it? Um, mm. There's loads of stories out there about the many millions that he's donated to charity, to different charities, by the way, all over the world. Yeah. So it kind of seems somewhat unfair to single him out. And that's yeah. why I was just a little bit concerned for him more than anyone else, that the PR of this has just done him a great disservice. I wish there was a way that he could come out and, you know, release a statement uh, yeah. and try and put things right, because I don't think it's as straightforward as it seems. And it's just no. making him look real bad right now, man. You know what I mean? Because... Um, I was even talking to my girlfriend about it and she was like, oh, you know, you've got guys earning that much a week and mm. surely he can afford to contribute and this is terrible and it puts football footballers in a bad light. And I guess yeah. when you approach it from that, the layman's perspective, it does, you know. Mm. But yeah. we know, those of us who know Ozu, who know about Ozu, we know that um, his philanthropy is almost legendary. So it seems a little bit unfair to castigate him and throw him under the bus at a time like this now. but. Yeah. I don't know, man. How do you think he can bounce back from this? What do you think he should do? What do you think should happen? I mean, I, mean, I think, um, I mean, I, I'm not Ozu's biggest fan on the pitch, um, and we've spoke about that many times, but I'm not just going to jump on his back for it. I think he needs to, uh, you know, with you, with you saying about the charity work, he, he seems like a person who's willing to help under the right circumstances. So, I would like to think the club and him will come to an agreement. As you said um, at the start, I think what the club have done is they've tried to force this on the players. Um, the story was in the press very early. I mean, even before this, we heard a week or so ago that they were talking about a pay cut. I mean, why was that again being fed to the press? It's like they were trying to use that to put pressure on the players, which I think is the wrong way to handle footballers, yeah, especially yeah. the yeah. You know, yeah. deal with a man for man and say, look, Times are hard. We need to help out the non-playing staff. Will you take a cut or a deferral? They seem to use the press too much, and I think that's aggravated some of the players. So. Yeah, because uh, the club were quite clever, weren't they? Because first they announced that the executives were going to take the hit, um, mm. which is fair enough. Um, good on them for that. But uh, we don't know what Kroenke's doing exactly. I mean, we're going to talk about something in a minute relating to Kroenke, but... Yeah, we don't know exactly what these guys are doing. So, yeah, man, I was very uncomfortable with the way the story got out there, man. I think it's a bit, yeah. that's a bit wrong. You know what I mean? I'm not, yeah. I wasn't comfortable with that at all. But yeah, I just think that Ozil's PR has taken a massive hit. And I hope that he will do something to address that to bones. I mean, he doesn't tend to, he doesn't tend to say too much for someone that's such a high profile player and has mm. so many followers on Twitter, et cetera you would have thought that he would have been a bit more media savvy in terms of getting his side out there. Or maybe, or do you think it suits him to not say anything at this stage? I mean, I, I don't know. I would have thought it was probably in his interest to release a statement to, you know, quell the rumours as such and to give his mm. side of the story. Or do you think it's more wise of him to maybe not say nothing and see how things play out? What do you think? Yeah, no, no. I'm sure. I'm sure he'll come out with a, a tweet at some stage. You know, when he, uh, I remember when he wasn't in the team and he came out with this tweet, like, you know, and, you know, and they all, they all love him. I'm sure he'll come out of this looking good somehow. Um, I reckon yeah. they'll come to some sort of agreement, even if it's a deferral. So, yeah. at the end of the day, if someone's asking you to give up your wages or a portion of it. It doesn't matter if you earn three hundred and fifty pound or three hundred and fifty thousand. Do you want to know? the reasons why, and you want to know where that money is going. And yeah. if he doesn't, you know, trust Cronke or the way he's handled it, um, you know, then then that's down to him. I'm not going to, I'm not going to hammer him for it, to be honest. Yeah. And I should also point out as well that it's not everybody that's having a go at Ozil. I mean, I don't want to make no. this show, make it look like everyone's against him because it's interesting because um, at AFTV, um, we did a poll, which I helped compile. We put it on our community page. And um, when the story broke and Piers Morgan was going in on him hard, you know what I mean? And everyone was taking yeah. 
chunks out of him and Gary Neville was having his say, he thought, okay, we'll do a poll. So the poll was simply was, is Ozil in the wrong for refusing a pay cut? So when we posted it, I was thinking, right, this, he's going to get absolutely hammered. But it was interesting. And I've got the stats right here. Um, so the poll went up. And um, do you think that Ozil was in the wrong for refusing to take a pay cut? That's how it was worded. And yeah. 53% said yes. But then 47% said no. And that's, that's almost mm. a 50-50 split. So, yeah. you know what I mean? It's not everyone that's, that's having a pop in for it. There are a lot mm. of people who seem to be on his side. You know? And like I said, I'm kind of mixed. Because yeah. um, a bit like you are, we think, yeah, okay, it would have been a good thing for you to do. But mm. having said that, there are other reasons why he might not want to do it, and we should respect that. So, yeah, yeah. I guess, I guess your story's going to run for a few more days, man. But I, I was a bit yeah. perturbed at how that story got out. I, did, I didn't really yeah. like that, even though we're all talking about it, so it's news, and I guess we benefit from the story in a certain way. But having said that, yeah. Way it was leaked out, I thought that was that did him a bit of a disservice there. So I'd be interested yeah. to know how that got out. You're saying that um, the fact that John Cross was the first one to put the story out there would indicate that it comes from within the club, and I see that. Um, but it could easily have been a disgruntled player. Or, yeah, or somebody who had put wind of the meeting um, from wherever, you know what I mean? So presumably they, the players had this meeting using a, uh, a, a link. Um, mm. And when you have situations like that, you know what I mean? S stuff can get out there. So Yeah. Okay, man. Thanks for that. Um, so moving yeah. on then. Moving on swiftly. So Stan Kroenke eh, last week when we were talking about uh, cuts and deferrals and all sorts of stuff like that, he made some statement about... Um, that he was going to make a major cash injection into the club. Um, I just wanted to think briefly, let you briefly about what you thought about that, and also the uh, continued Arsenal transfer rumours. Mm. Um, we've been with one or two players. Um, the Partey story don't go away. Disasi uh, Kazafa, was it? I'm not butchering those names. Uh, one or two others. What do you think, man? Do you think we'll be signing anyone or not? I mean, um, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be confident that we'll make major signings. Um, we don't spend big money at the best of times. So on the back of all this and the financial hit the club will be taking, can you really see Kronke spending big, big money on players? I mean, if we do spend, I'm sure it will be at the expense of, of a player leaving the club, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you think of this party thing then? Because the party you know one was interesting because we'd been linked with him for a while. Yeah. Uh, and then there was a story in the week that, again, we featured on AFTV, and that was concerning Partey, that if we was going to go for Partey, that we might let Lacazette go in the opposite direction, uh, a swap deal. Yeah. Uh, and again, uh, we did a poll on, that, on the AFTV community page about that. And um, it surprised me, although maybe it shouldn't have, but majority of the fans seem to be in favour of that swap. Um, yeah. So what do, you, what do you think about that, man? I mean, I'm not going to lie, I'm a big fan of Thomas Pott. And I think he's a very, very good player, aggressive, strong, athletic, everything that we need in midfield, in, in my opinion. Um, at the expense of Lacazette, I mean, I have been critical of Lacazette. Um, but I'm still not necessarily looking at him as someone we need to get rid of. I think there are a lot of players below him who we should be looking to get out the door first. Um, yeah. And especially with the Aubameyang situation, if Aubameyang does go, all of a sudden we need Lacazette. So I'm not necessarily in favour of swapping him. I'd, I'd love to see the club go and buy Partey outright. Really. Yeah, absolutely. I'm with you on that. Because, I mean, the thing about Lacazette is, and this is something that I've said to one or two people that's approached me to talk about this, is that uh, not too long ago, <laughs> Lacazette was, a, was being voted by the fans as player of the season. OK? Yeah. Um, OK, his form this year has not been exemplary. We know that. He's only got the nine goals. Um, actually, just before the break, he looked like he was starting to come back into a bit more form. Yeah. But do you really want to get rid of one of your better strikers? Like you said, 
especially at a time when it's looking like we might lose our main striker. Do you think that would yeah. be good business? I don't think it is. Um, no, no. I'm a, and I'm you a look fan at of uh, Lacazette. I, I want him to stay, man. Yeah. I don't want him to go. And then mm -hmm. you look at the market right now as well. Like, what what kind of good strikers are there that are available? We're being linked with guys from Celtic, an unknown guy from Belgium. Like, we need to we need to look after what we've got. And for me, a Bamiang and Lacazette, I'd be trying to keep both of them, um, or if not, at least keep one of them. Um, and I think also. You look at Liverpool, you look at Firmino as their central striker. Firmino gets similar amount of goals to Lacazette, 10, 15, those sorts of numbers. But the two wingers score a lot of goals for Liverpool. And I think that's what Arsenal need to address. We need Pepe, we need Martinelli or whoever's out wide to score more goals. And that takes some of the pressure off Lacazette. So I would give Lacazette one more season, if I'm honest, um, before I move it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm with you on that. I, 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 I desperate to see him stay. I don't want him to go anywhere. Um, and so going on then to Abamyang. Um, uh, not a day yeah. seems to go past that this man's not linked with a move away to somewhere else. I mean, today it was uh, a move to Chelsea, which, yeah. if you think about it logically, it's not out the woods, is it? No. It's not beyond comprehension that he could go to Chelsea. You know what I mean? Because another big club in London. Um, Chelsea could afford him. They need a striker. You know what I mean? Mm. It, you could see that happening, man. I, I mean, I don't want to see yeah. that happen, obviously, but what's your thoughts yeah. on that, man? I mean, I must admit, when I woke up and I saw that today, I was, I, I must admit, I started to get worried straight away, simply because mm. I could actually see that taking place. I mean, we've seen it before with other players that we've lost mm. to Chelsea. Um, yeah. So what's your thoughts, man? What do you think about that? I mean, do you know what? Every every day, every week, um, I'm more and more convinced that we are not going to be um, keeping a Bamiang next season because why are the club not just putting this to bed? They could easily come out and say, look, a Bamiang, we want to keep him. We're, we're in negotiations. We're, we're going to try and sort out a deal. He's our best player. You know, something along those lines. They are not saying anything. I mean, Mikel Arteta was on Sky, I think, last week. He did an interview on BT Sport as well. He didn't really mention Aubameyang. So clearly there is some sort of issue there. I mean, unless they're just thinking, you know, we'll keep it all behind closed doors and not say anything. But, you know, something like the Chelsea move might appeal to him because you hear that Aubameyang is very settled in London. He loves the Premier League. Chelsea would offer him a bigger wage. Um, like, as you said, they need a striker. I mean, I don't think Tammy Abraham is the answer for them. And uh, it's worrying. It is worrying. And, and to be honest, you just want to see a change in attitude from Arsenal. You know, act, be proactive and go and get something done. I mean, how good would we all feel right now if they announced that Aubameyang had signed a new contract? We'd be celebrating. But, you know, this club doesn't seem to change, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's very disappointing um, that the club don't appear to be more robust in trying to keep him. You know what I mean? I thought they would have made some assertive statements to the effect that, yes, we want him to stay. I mean, OK, the owner came out and he made this announcement about a major cash injection. Some people were questioning whether the cash injection was to to deal with the, um, the furlough, non-furlough that the club mm. are, are, are adopting. Um, or whether it was to do with um, players and bringing players in. But I would have thought that as part of doing so, you should have been reaching out in public to your star player and saying, look, you know, we, we have resources available. We want him to stay. I'm just, <laughs> it's just kind of giving that impression that they're, if not happy to see him go, but they resign themselves to letting him go. And if you're a Bamiyan and you're, Obviously, sitting there observing that day in, day out, you, you're seeing all this stuff, you're being linked with this and that, and the club are not coming out and actively saying, we want you to stay. I mean, OK, yeah. I'll, I'll say a few words, but there hasn't been anything really decisive, has there, from them? No. Then, all the while, Aubameyang, he's getting his head turned, I would have thought. Mm. You know what I mean? You even had the president of the Gabon FA saying, look, you need to get the hell out of Dodge. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's baffling, man, to me. 
um, and to you and to a lot of the fans, we're thinking, look, come on, bro. You've got yeah. a guy there that most clubs, even Man United apparently, are, are sniffing around about it. You know what I mean? Yeah. A lot of these top clubs, they are, uh, they're sniffing around. They're making it be known they're sniffing around. So basically, they're unsettling the player. Surely it's mm -hmm. Arsenal's job, if they want to keep him, to come out and say, listen, you know, he's our prize possession. Prize, that's it. Uh, and we're committed to wanting him to stay at the club. And that just doesn't appear to be happening. And that's, from my point of view, is disappointing. But hey, man. Yeah. Um, okay, so we've done that one. Um, and we're kind of reaching the end of the show. So as we did last week, probably touch on a few lighter-hearted, seemingly <laughs> lighter-hearted things to wind things up. Um, so in doing so, uh, footballers behaving badly. Um, <laughs> not a week seems to go away. Yeah. Not, not a week seems to pass, sorry, without a footballer, you know what I mean, just making an yeah. utter arse of himself. And this, this week, it appears to be uh, Mo Sissoko and um, Serge Oreo of Tottenham. Always seems to be Tottenham, mm -hmm. isn't it? Uh, yeah, yeah. They, were, they were caught. Actually, not so much caught. They filmed themselves training together. Clearly mm. flouting the uh, the government guideline rules. So, Curtis, what's your thoughts on that, man? We spoke earlier I mean, about three cars. This seems to be another one. Yeah, I mean, um, Sir Joria, he's a bit of a, you know, he seems a bit of a loose cannon at the best of times, don't he? But, I mean, we all know the guidelines. How are these? Uh, can you imagine the phone call, them two saying, yeah, let's meet up and go for a job? I mean, what are you thinking, man? Come on, man. Well, you know what? Know. Correct, correct me if I'm wrong, right? The manager, yeah. Jose Mourinho, he got his collar felt, didn't he? Because yeah, yeah, he'd he been did. Train, he, him and Ndombele have been doing some training sessions in the park, some park together. And that's yeah, the yeah. story emerged yeah. there. Yeah. And he got his collar felt. He had to issue a humbling, grovelly apology. Yeah. And that's the manager, right? So that was like, what? That was less than two weeks ago. And now yeah. these two, I mean, what's going through their heads, man? It's crazy, isn't it? I mean, you you remember a few weeks before football stopped when um, Andembele had that famous 45-minute performance that he got annihilated for? I yeah. think Mourinho must have thought, you know what, even if my health's at risk, man, I'm going to get you fit, bro. I don't care. <laughs> but he got it horribly wrong. But then, yes, yeah, Sissoko and Aurea, I don't know what they're thinking. And then, like you said, they didn't even do it like somewhere quiet. They weren't even discreet. The man of feel they are not of apologetic, bro. Yeah, the man man. Filming and say, yeah, look at us breaking the rules. Yeah, I'm yeah. Clever. I'm like <laughs> <laughs> it's like the two naughty kids skiving off school, isn't it, man? Then, then, oh man, I don't know what you know, they're you, thinking. You, you know, you know what it is. I think maybe they thought Arsenal been in the in the news so much this week, man. We got to do a little bit to take some attention from them. <laughs> And let's come up with a little yeah. stunt to take the attention from Ozil because, boy, I I was, I don't know. when I saw that today, man, I was like, rah, what is wrong with these, man? You know what I mean? Like, you seem... And the thing is, on a more serious note, uh, and we're always defending footballers because they are easy targets. They're easily scapegoated, as we've seen with the Ozil team. Um, but then sometimes it's kind of hard to defend these men when they do things like that because... Correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't see too many other sportsmen out there doing crap like that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Most men are, you know, these guys have got big houses as well. I'm sure they've got gyms mm -hmm. in their houses and stuff like that. They can do yeah. all the training they need. And if you want to go out for a run, I mean, I go out for a run, you go out for a run. I've been going out for a run nearly every day since the lockdown. Yeah. I don't ring up. I don't, I say, yo, guys, yo, let's <laughs> meet up, man, around my yard and go for a five mile run. We just don't do that, yeah. innit? No, you know, no, you got to be, um, all jokes aside, you got to, be respectful of what's going on right now, even if you don't 100% agree with it. I mean, I'm, I know people who are saying, ah, oh, this lockdown, man, rear, rear, rear. But I say to people, listen, let's just follow the rules. Let's listen to the experts. It's not going to go on forever. There's people in much worse situations than us. So people out there dying and being severely incapacitated by this, man. So it's just respectful to just follow the rules and keep it moving as we were, you know what I mean? So. Yeah, for but real. yeah, man. Um, so that football is behaving badly this week. I'm sure next <laughs> week somebody will be, be having a sex, sex party at the yard or pool party <laughs> or 
you yeah. know what I mean? Organising some mass training run, a little mini yeah. marathon amongst footballers in Hyde Park <laughs> or something like that. But, um, hey, the, um, I just did one of, uh, this is something that me and you spoke about privately and we had a little joke about. It's sort of non-Arsenal, but it's a bit light-hearted. So, um, the beef, man, between um, Grain Cena uh. and Pogba. <laughs> 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 So for those of you who don't know, Graeme Sinus, for some reason, he's just got a bee in his bonnet about Paul Pogba. I don't know what it is. I mean, mm. he will tell you it's because he's not performing on the pitch. But it does appear that every time Graeme Sinus talks about football, the words Paul Pogba has to come out of his mouth in some kind of derogatory <laughs> fashion. Um, yeah. And it's kind, of, it's kind of become folklore, isn't it? Everyone talks about it, whether you support Man United or not. It's always... It's, a subject that people like to laugh about. How Graham Finn mm -hmm. this almost unhealthy obsession with Paul Popper. So anyway, so what happened was um, somebody's obviously mentioned this to Paul Pogba. And Paul Pogba, <laughs> <laughs> Paul Pogba being the kind of diva guy that he is, um, he's been, probably been a bit clever as well, a bit cute. He's like, Graham Sinus, who's that? You know what I mean? I don't know him. People tell me about this guy. <laughs> <laughs> so that was his. So that was Paul Pogba's repost. He's like, Graham Sinus, like, who's that? Now, for a man of, <laughs> yeah, you know where I'm going with this, right? So yeah, yeah. for a man like um, Graham Sinus, he's got a big ego, and he's a real yeah. alpha male. That don't go down too well with him. So <laughs> when he was told, apparently he was really upset about it. He was like, what? What did he say? Oh, I think it's a case of a uh, show me your medal, son. So I'm like, when I heard that, I was like, rah, because. Whatever you say about Popper, you can talk about his haircuts and his seemingly um, blasé attitude on certain things. And, you know, you can question as well the uh, legitimacy of some of these so-called injuries that we're hearing about. But the one thing you can't say about Paul Popper is that he's not talented. The man's hella talented. Man. And he's won a lot of things in a relatively short space of time. He's only 27 and he's amassed a load of... Uh, trophies and you know awards and all sorts of stuff so for you to say put your medals on the table i was like right so then it, that got me thinking so then <laughs> me being me i thought you know what let me get some receipts out you know what i mean so i started to look because that just didn't sit right you know what i mean like when soon as yeah, get your medals like yeah you may have won more medals but hopper is we're not talking about a run-of-the-mill player here man he's a very accomplished mm -hmm. player he's done a lot in a short space of time so what I did now, me being me, I had a look at the respective trophy, trophy cabinets, as it were. So like, I'm looking at Sunis, and yeah, big up to Sunis. He's won like six league titles between England and Scotland. He's won three European Cups. Obviously, the equivalent of that now is Champions League. He's won a League Cup and he's won a Coppa Italia. But Pogba is equally, if not more impressive, man. Um, he's won one World Cup, which Sunis will never win. And let's be honest, if you're... Um, mm -hmm. If you're a footballer, they always say the height of your career is to represent your country. Now, yeah, Pogba's, yeah. Not just, Pogba's not just represented his country. Mm. He's represented his country and won a World Cup, which is, as far as I'm concerned, is the, the, biggest. Highest, the biggest thing you can win in football is winning a World Cup. Mm. Some people might say Champions League, but I disagree. Mm. World Cup, he's won four Italian leagues, right? Mm. Two Italian Super Cups, two Italian Cups, a League Cup, he's won the Europa League, and he's won a World Cup at under-20 level. Now, listen, man, and you have to take into account as well that Pogba's only 27. So he's mm. still got, what, another four or five years at least, I would have thought. And, and yeah. you know, no disrespect, but Paul Pogba's not going to end up at Burnley. He's, he's, <laughs> if he leaves <laughs> Man United, he's going to go to a next top yeah. shot of club that's going to be winning trophies. So... To me, man, Graham Cena says, show me your medals. I think you've come up short, bro. Yeah. <laughs> to me, Pogba's, re Pogba's resume is more impressive. What do you think, man? Well, uh, you know what? I'm, uh, Sunes is just a sour old man, isn't he, man? You, you know, he, he sounds very bitter when he talks about Pogba, man. But he can't, talk to, he can't talk to Pogba, man. You know, Sunes, you know, he was a bit of an animal, a rough player in centre midfield. In terms of talent, he's not a patch on Paul Pogba, you know. Pogba not only won the World Cup, he scored in the World Cup final. You know, he led that team to victory as well. You know, you see that famous um, 
team talk where he gave the team talk at half time yeah. to the French. Pogba got 15 goals last year for my new. You can't talk to Pogba. Pogba's a beast. One of the best midfielders in the world. Uh, I don't think Souness was ever one of the best midfielders in the world. He was no. part of a very good Liverpool side um, back in the day. He was a, he was a workhorse. But um, I think there's a lot of jealousy there, man. He's, he's hating on the fact that, you know, Pogba, you're flashy, you're successful. You're earning probably 10, 15 times the, the money that Souness was earning. Very bitter, very bitter person. It sounds to me, but um, yeah, I think there's also a bit of a. I think there's also a bit of cultural bias as well. If I'm yeah, yeah, and, I, and mm. I'm trying to be diplomatic when I say that. Yeah, I know you are. I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, listen, man. I don't want. I don't want to make accusations outright, but I think you touched on it. You know, what I mean, you got a guy like Suna, and mm. he's a guy like Pogba with the flashy hair. He's doing the dabbing and. Ray, yeah. Twitter followers, and he always seems like he's having a great time, and that. and and Sunis, don't get me wrong. Listen, soon I grew up. I'm old enough to remember Ray Sunis. Yeah, yeah. He was a quality player. He wasn't just a hard man. I think sometimes I'm telling people say, ah, oh, he was just a man that went around fouling people. No, he he could play, man. He could play. Trust me. Um. Mm. So yeah, he was a, he was a baller as well in his own right. But I think it's a cultural dissonance, if you like, because. He yeah. looks at someone like Pogba and he somehow can't help but think back to his day when, you know I mean, the emphasis was slightly different. And he's yeah. looking at this guy, he's earning way more money than Sunis will ever earn. Or, as, you know, mm -hmm. um, he's seeing him and he's thinking, oh, if I in my day, this and that. But it's not your day, bro. You know what I mean? No. And um, like you said, Pogba is an accomplished, decorated footballer in his own right. And I think mm -hmm. he's just coming across as a bit of a hater. And he just yeah. seems to have this like almost unhealthy obsession with Paul Pogba. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And indeed, it's like done the rounds on social media. So I just thought I would just never heard of you, mate. Like... Never heard of you, mate. Never heard of you. <laughs> <laughs> it's always easy for players um, to do that, isn't it? Like you, you know, they yeah. go, oh, in my era, it is my era now. But the problem is, it's not their era anymore, man. You know what I mean? They should just chill. And just yeah, man. relax. Hey, you know, Sunis doesn't need to do that. He he was a great no. player in his own right. And uh, Pogba is a great player in his own right. You haven't got to keep trying to detract from the man, you know what I mean, to try and make yourself look good. It's just not good look. Mm. But anyway, listen, man, we're coming to the end of the show. Um, yeah, man. Thanks to all the people out there who supported the show and keep watching and supporting the channel. Um, I just want to say as well, before we close, um, thanks to you, Curtis. Last week you came on the... Um, the 24 hour gig um to yeah. raise money for the nhs man that was that was big of you to do that respect um yeah, it, was a, yeah it was a it was a fantastic thing that the, the guys did man big up my brother um yeah, big man. up all all the influencers and contributors from far and wide who helped out that was really good um all yeah. the people behind the scenes who helped as well man so yeah man um so big up for that and um tell the people what where they can find you man yeah, man, check out the channel, Curtis Shaw TV. Going to do some live streams again, get some guests on there. Need yourself on there, Laurie, Robbie, a few of us. And uh, everyone, stay safe, take care, follow the guidelines, and uh, we'll be back next week. Yeah, that's very much my party message. I'd just like to wish everybody out there, man, I hope you're all well, uh, healthy, keeping safe, observing the government lockdown, not doing a Serge Aurier and a... <laughs> and uh, Mo Sissoko, you know what I mean? Follow the guidelines. Together we will get through this. We'll come out the other end and um, it will be a better time for all of us in the long run, I'm sure. So listen, yeah. thanks again. Keep watching. Keep like, share, subscribe. Keep messaging us. And um, it's all good, man. See you next week. The coronavirus has not just affected the world of football, but has affected everybody. But you know what? We can defeat it. If you're displaying any of the symptoms, always make sure that you self-isolate. I know it's a terrible time, but we will defeat the coronavirus. We will be back.